Are you recording now? Branch. 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 Branch out. A podcast from the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney. Plant diseases have uh, have a potential of causing literally billions of dollars of crop losses every year. So it's very important to actually get on top of plant diseases. Area. Hey, I'm Vanessa Fuchs, and for this episode of Branch Out, I'm taking you inside the plant clinic at the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney to meet Dr. Ed Liu. Like us, plants can get sick, and at the plant clinic, Ed and his team are identifying, treating, and researching thousands of diseases which can affect our food crops and native plants. But sometimes figuring out what's wrong can get a bit like an episode of House or CSI. It's never a clear-cut thing, because when you're, when you're trying to work out what's wrong with something, we have to actually say, oh, is it a disease or not to start with? You know? Or it could be a, an insect, or sometimes it could be mammals. Um, it could be atmospheric pollution. So, you know, we once diagnosed a hedge that had kind of like a, a, a bit of a hole, a, a dieback, and we couldn't actually work out you know, what caused it. We knew that, you know, it wasn't disease because we've done all the disease diagnostics. And after discussing with the clients, like, you know, what have you done to that place? You know, is there any construction work? Have you been using any kind of chemicals? Blah, blah, blah. You know, we worked out that every morning there's a motorbike that parks right next to that part along the hedge with the exhaust pipe just sticking out to that dead part of the hedge. Oh yes. my god, this is some and detective work. There is a whole lot of CSI work. So we always say put on your CSI hat and start investigating. I mean, this seems like <laughs> this is beyond your field. Like, you I, know, I know, I know. But we don't do that. So often we rule all of those things out and we send a report. Out. <laughs> but even when motorbikes are ruled out, that still leaves thousands of different plant diseases and identification is tricky. To show us how he figures out what's wrong with a specimen, Ed's got a few plants out on the bench that are looking a little under the weather. Okay, so this log here, it's got some weird white stuff growing on it. Do you know what it is? That would just be um, ooze from the plant, from the tree, uh, sometimes called kino. Um, a lot of trees do that when they're stressed. So that's kind of like a secondary effect of the real problem here. The real problem here, or the root problem, is actually trunk rot. So you can see the internal discoloration here. Um, there is rot inside. And so the tree is obviously you know, experiencing uh, quite a bit of stress. Like when uh, you've got the flu and you get a runny nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you can put it that like. way, you can put it that way. Yeah, that, that is actually a good indication for us to say, mm hmm, something's not quite right somewhere. And sometimes that something that's not quite right is it's internal. And that means we need to get a closer look. The next step of detective work is to get the pathogen that's causing the disease growing outside of the plant on an agar plate. Okay, Ooh, these two plates weird. here have been incubated and then you can see all kinds of different things growing out from the tissue. Yeah, it looks like what you'd find growing in the corners of your fridge if you don't clean it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Not saying that's, that's me. <laughs> so then what we do is we cut out a little bit of the growth of the fungal colony and plate that out onto separate plates. So each plate will have what we call a peel culture of just that fungus. Yeah. And this is one of them. And this has also been incubated for probably two weeks now. You can see that it has grown. Yeah, so like a furry white plate. center and then there's lots of black little dots That's around. Right. It's like black tiny little ants. dots, exactly. You know what those black little dots are? They're actually footing structures or rather parts of the fungus that produces spores. Ooh, so there are thousands of spores there if not more than that even. And, uh, and spores are really useful when it comes to identifying fungi, because um, we look at the spores or the spore structures under the microscope and we'll try to key out what, um, what genus or species that fungus is. Can we look at something under the microscope? We could try. Because I imagine it's going to look way different again. Okay, well, you have to follow me to the microscope room. Here we are in the microscope room. The benches are full of different microscopes and other equipment. We've got 
a dissecting microscope here and we also have a compound microscope there. Ed is putting one of the plates with the furry looking mould containing the plant pathogen under the dissecting microscope for me to take a look. Which, is, uh, which has much lower magnification compared to the compound microscope. Even with a lower magnification, as soon as I looked through it, I knew I was entering a completely weird and different world. Wow. I know, they're fascinating. You can spend hours looking down microscopes. I see a huge network of what looks like cobwebs filled with tiny black dots. But then Ed tells me they're only just beginning to scratch the surface of this microscopic world. Oh, this is the compound microscope now. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to see more. You'll, you'll be able to see the actual spores. Now Ed's put the agar plate under the compound microscope with the high magnification and I'm speechless. How do I even describe this? Well, I couldn't. I had entered a world so foreign to me, I had no idea what I was looking at. But for Ed, it's so familiar. This is where the pathogen truly starts to reveal itself to him. So if you look at the, the tips of the spores, you see appendages. They're almost like... Um, oh yeah, there's one. Um, like tails. A, yeah, a little extra section. Yes. Now these are all really important features or characters to identify what it is. Okay, why, why is that? What does it tell you? It tells me that it belongs to a particular genus. Off the top of my head, I would say that it's a Pestiloteopsis. From that tiny little thing yes, on a tiny but thing. I won't be able to tell you the species. <laughs> Look, that's impressive enough. I chose this plate because I know this is um, uh, uh, this particular fungus has beautiful spores. So they're beautiful to you. Absolutely. I mean, well, I would say you said it's beautiful too. Yeah, it's I the, agree. Yeah, you know, hearing your response. A lot of fungi don't produce spores. And a lot of fungi, they produce just very simple spores, one-celled, colorless. In other words, impossible to identify. Right. Yeah. So then what would you do? What would be another strategy to try and identify it? DNA technologies. Uh, looking for signal DNA, like, um, like, uh, like a fingerprint. Um, a lot of fungi have a very specific uh, uh, bits of DNA that says, this is who I am. This sounds <laughs> so similar to like when you're going into a hospital or a doctor and you're going, I have these symptoms. Sometimes it's really obvious. Exactly. Exactly. And you can go, yep, you've got this. And mm -hmm. other times it's mm -hmm. like this big mystery and you've got to problem solve and mm. try different tests and different yeah. things. Yeah, and exactly. And so what got you interested in this field? Like, I feel like you're very passionate about um, it. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, that was a long time ago now. I, I have to say the first class or the first prank class where I looked at a whole wide range of fungal structures and fungal spores, I fell in love with fungi. Instantly? Pretty much instantly. What was it about it? Is it just a feeling or is there something specific? It's just, as you responded earlier, looking down a microscope, it's, it was very much like being introduced um, into a, a totally different world. It's like a, a, a tiny hidden world that's fascinating uh, but not obvious to, to the naked eye. Many different strains causing a huge range of wilt diseases and a lot of these are actually food crops. Oh, one really prominent example is the Panama disease on banana. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. I think I remember that. Yeah. Now that's caused by a very specific strain of a pathogen called Fusarium oxysporum. And it enters um, the, the whole plant via the roots um, and then causing blockages of the vascular systems or the, the plumbing system, if you like, resulting in wilt and eventual death of the plant. Oh, so the whole plant, the whole banana plant, plant will die, not just bananas won't be produced, the Absolutely, whole thing. absolutely, yes. Right. And it has the potential of devastating a whole plantation. Plant diseases are very significant to us. And of course, you know, once we've, uh, you know, reduced the incidence of disease, you know, we help farmers protect our crops. In other words, protect our of food supply. Thanks for listening to Branch Out. 
Next episode, we're going with Dr. Maurizio Rosetto to Taronga Zoo, and we're visiting a native animal found in Queensland's rainforest, which has been known to be called the dinosaur bird. Oh, <gasps> she's so close. Hey, gorgeous. Oh my goodness. She's a pretty bird. <laughs> she's, she's gorgeous with her straight cask and those long, beautiful wattles at the front. She's a, she's a pretty good specimen of a cassowary. We're exploring the fascinating and important relationship between plants and animals. Plants are really dependent on animals for pollination, for dispersal. Usually when fruit falls off the tree, it's because it's ripe. And that's the whole point, to be ripe so that it's more accessible to the animals that will disperse it. And, and animals, of course, are interested in those because they're packed with nutrients. Mm -hmm.